we make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelton. Welcome to the show. When it comes to countertops, well, there's laminate and tile and granite and quartz and solid surface material, and now concrete. Not only is concrete durable, but it can be crafted in hundreds of different colors and surface treatments. You know, until recently, I would have questioned whether this was really a do-it-yourself project. Well, that was until I met Jeff Kerlick. Now, Jeff casts his countertops in molds you can easily make yourself. And the results? Well, stay tuned. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. I've also got a great tip for you in keeping track of nuts, bolts, washers, springs, and other small odds and ends the next time you take something apart. Hey, how you doing? You know, I've always liked the natural look of the tile here in this bathroom, but on the other hand, I've never felt that this countertop and sink really goes with it as well as I'd like. Now, I've considered some options here. Thought about granite, but I don't think that's quite going to look right either. I uh, don't really want to put more tile up here, and I don't want to laminate. So what I think I might be interested in, though, is concrete. That's right, concrete. So I've asked my friend Jeff Kerlick, who's a specialist in concrete countertops, to come over and have a look. Jeff, how you been, man? I'm uh, good. Good to see you. How <laughs> Come are on you? In. Come thank on you. In. Thank you. Okay, well, here it is. What do you think? I think you've got a fantastic opportunity for concrete countertops. You have a very natural look to the tile, a lot of colors involved there. So, with the concrete, we can pick up on any one of those colors because we can do 1,500 different colors of concrete. 1,500? 1,500. I got to choose one. Eh? You have to choose <laughs> one. So, we'll, we'll try and pick up on maybe a gray or a tan and uh, it'll look great. So you think that uh, the texture would be a good match for this? The texture is very natural with the concrete, so with little imperfections in the tile, it'll go wonderfully. Okay, Great. Well, I'm sold. What do you got here? These are strips of wood. What I'll do with these is we'll make a template of your existing countertop. Okay. We'll take the template, make our counter from that. Okay. I'll let you go to work. All right. Jeff lays strips of quarter-inch plywood along the edges of the existing countertop then attaches them together using hot melt glue. When he's finished, he's got a template that will allow him to duplicate the exact size and shape. Then, Jeff and I make a trip to the Home Improvement Center to pick up the materials we'll need for the new countertop. Sand, concrete, rigid foam insulation, caulk, and this material called melamine. Now this is actually particle board that has vinyl bonded to both sides. Now Jeff is going to use this to build the mold into which he'll pour the concrete. When the concrete is cured, he'll knock the mold apart. And it's this vinyl surface on here that will allow it to release easily. Jeff goes to work cutting the melamine into smaller pieces that will be used for the bottom and sides of the mold. He places the template on top of a larger panel, traces the outline, then cuts the mold bottom to size. The laser on this miter saw makes it easy to align the cut. To make sure the sides are vertical, Jeff uses a block made from scrap that he holds against the inside surface as he nails. With all the sides in place, he makes a final check by test fitting the template in the mold. Let me show you what Jeff's going to be doing. Rather than cutting and boring the openings for the sink and faucet, they'll be molded into the countertop. 
This will be done by attaching forms to the mold bottom and pouring the concrete around them. Once the concrete has cured, the forms will be removed, leaving the openings. So in the box uh, that Kohler has supplied for you, there will be a template for the sink. Great. And what we'll do with this, they provide an exact outline of the sink hole. We're going to cut this out. We'll create our form from that. The forms are made from one and a half inch thick rigid foam insulation. The sink template is laid on top and traced. Then the shape is cut out using a bandsaw. A jigsaw or long blade would also do the job. The edges of the form are wrapped in clear packaging tape. The tape will allow the form to release easily and create a smooth finished edge on the sink opening. Next, Jeff uses a piece of inch and a half drain pipe to punch out small cylinders from the insulation. These two are wrapped in packaging tape. Finally, the forms are attached to the mold base with silicone to create what will eventually be the sink opening and holes for the faucets and spout. The seams in the mold are sealed with silicone to give the countertop edges a smooth, rounded shape. This spray-on tooling liquid will allow Jeff to get a perfectly clean, uniform bead by drawing his finger over the joint. The mold is finished and ready for concrete. First, dry concrete and sand are mixed together. And we're going to start adding our color. So, so what is this? That's a uh, oxide, which will make the concrete a deeper gray, sort of a soapstone color. And then this is our special mix, which we'll add in there, makes it strong so that we've got the strength to hold up as a countertop. This additive is a blend of plasticizers and other materials Jeff has developed from his own experience. With the dry ingredients thoroughly mixed, it's time to add the water. Mixing time is somewhat critical. Too much or too little can affect the strength, appearance, and pliability of the concrete. Next, the mixture is poured into the form filling it about two-thirds full. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. An orbital sander held on edge serves as an excellent vibrator, leveling the concrete mixture, distributing the aggregate, and eliminating air bubbles. Then steel reinforcing mesh and rebar is laid in place. The vibration causes it to sink to the center of the mold. Finally, more concrete is poured on top and a piece of wood is used to screed off the excess. It'll take this concrete about a week to cure. My friend Jeff Kurlick is making a bathroom countertop from concrete. So far, he's built the mold, created forms for the sink opening and faucet holes, mixed and poured the concrete. A week was needed for curing. Jeff's coming back today. Before he gets here, I'm going to remove the existing countertop. To start with, I'm removing the vanity doors to give me plenty of work room. Then I shut off the water, take off the P-trap on the sink drain, and remove the supply lines.
This molded countertop and sink is attached to the cabinet with silicone adhesive. I'm cutting through the silicone using a two inch wide putty knife. Next, I cut through the sealant along the edge with a sharp utility knife. This coal chisel that I've ground into a long taper works like a wedge, easily separating the top from the base. A flat pry bar finishes the job. Wow. So it's been a week. a week. Now, it doesn't take concrete a week to set up, does it? No, the concrete will get hard um, within about 24 hours. I like to leave it in the form for up to a week because that slows the curing process down. And what happens then is that the concrete will be stronger the slower it cures, and that will enable us to work with it, flip it over, start polishing it. First, Jeff cuts the form for the sink opening into sections then prize the pieces out. Next, he taps the sides of the mold apart and removes them. Together, we stand the countertop on edge and carefully remove the mold bottom. Finally, the tape-wrapped foam cylinders are pushed out, leaving the holes for the faucet fixture. The edges of the countertop are smoothed and polished using a resin-backed diamond pad. Actually, the sides and top are polished three times with progressively finer pads lubricated with water. Sealing is the final step. This milky liquid will dry clear and make the surface resistant to stains and spills. While Jeff is finishing up the polishing, I go upstairs and begin installing the fixtures on the sink. Plumber's putty rolled into a coil and laid around the drain opening will make a watertight seal. The tailpiece is inserted from the bottom, hand tightened, and snugged up using a pair of multi-groove pliers. The sink will rest on these brackets or rails that Jeff installs on the inside of the vanity. The sink goes in first, the countertop will set on top. Now I can go ahead and mount the faucet and valves on the new countertop. These clamps will hold the countertop on edge, leaving my hands free to work. The valves and faucet drop in from the top and are secured in place by tightening a large nut on the underside. The ring of plumber's putty will make a seal on the top, preventing any water from dripping into the cabinet below. Whenever I possibly can, I attach fixtures to a countertop before I set it in place. It's a whole lot easier to do it this way than lying on my back in the cramped quarters of a vanity cabinet. The hot and cold water valves connect to the faucet via this tubing. It's here, in the faucet, that the mixing takes place. With everything tight and ready to go, I clean off the excess putty. A bead of silicone along the lip of the sink will seal it securely to the bottom of the countertop. One thing about concrete is, it's heavy. The two of us are careful to keep the countertop vertical as we carry it in. When we're over the vanity, we lower it carefully into place. We're clear. The
The matching concrete backsplash attaches to the wall with a bit of silicone. Silicone is also used to seal the joint between the top and wall. All that's left to do now is attach the water lines, tighten them up, install the drain P-trap, and rehang the vanity doors. <laughs> now who would have thought that something that started out looking like this ended up looking as terrific as this? You know, it's made a believer out of me. As a matter of fact, I guess you could say I've had a concrete encounter. In this week's sweepstakes, we're giving away a Ryobi four-piece lithium-ion compact combo power tool kit. It includes a circular saw, a work light, cordless drill and charger, and reciprocating saw, all in a rugged carrying case. Now these tools are powerful, yet compact, lightweight, and easy to handle. The lithium-ion batteries hold a charge 40% longer. To enter the sweepstakes, just go to ronhazelton.com and click on the sweepstakes banner. Whenever I'm disassembling something and end up with a lot of small parts like this, I get a little bit concerned as to whether or not I'm actually going to be able to get it back together. Now, one thing that helps me is to organize these pieces as I take them apart, and that means putting them in the proper order and labeling them. This is a technique I've come up with that's helped me a lot. I start with a scrap piece of melamine shelving. Next, I apply strips of pressure-sensitive magnetic tape. And trim off the excess with a utility knife. When I'm disassembling something, I lay the screws, bolts, washers, springs, whatever, on the magnetic tape and label them as to where they go. Now, my parts are organized, they're labeled, and if this gets tipped, they're not going to go anywhere. And the real nice thing is, when I'm finished, all I have to do is take a little cleaner, wipe this off, and it's ready for the next project. A little while ago, I took a fixture off the shop wall here, and I'm left now with a patch that is bare wood. Obviously, it doesn't match the surrounding finish here. So I want to recolor this so that it blends in. The only problem is, when I went out to pick up the stains, I couldn't find exactly the right color. So what I did is I picked out two. This one, it's primarily yellow, and this one, which is a lot more red. By intermixing these two, I should be able to come up with an exact match. Pigmented stains, like these, always need to be stirred thoroughly because the coloring agents tend to settle to the bottom. A baby syringe is the perfect tool for transferring small amounts to a mixing container. I add first one color and then the other until it looks about right. So I've got two parts of the more yellow stain and one part of the more red. Let's see how this looks here. Well, that's not bad. It's just a little bit too red. So all I'm going to do is go back over here, go to the more yellow stain, and put a little bit more of that in. Well, not bad, huh? So if you can't find just the right color stain on the shelf, don't worry about it. Buy some that are close and then mix them together. The possibilities are limitless. We make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelson. Welcome to the show. The oscillating saw was invented for cutting off plaster casts. 
However, it's evolved into an extraordinarily versatile home improvement tool. The secret to that versatility, though, is in choosing the right blade for the job. Today, we'll see how to do that. Whether it's the winter cold or summer heat, the idea is to keep those climate extremes outside while making the indoors as comfortable as possible. State-of-the-art replacement windows play an important role in doing that. Installing them can even be a do-it-yourself project. We'll see how. Repairing wall damage is not that difficult, but restoring wall texture can be a bit challenging. Today I'll show you a technique that makes that job quite doable. This is an oscillating saw. Fitted with the correct blade, it can cut through wood, sheetrock, concrete board, plastic, metal, and more. The key is to use the right blade or attachment for the job. The oscillating saw was invented over 70 years ago, originally as a device for safely removing plaster casts. Circular saws move in a rotary direction at high speed. Reciprocating saws move back and forth in a linear direction. Oscillating saws alternate direction up to 20,000 times per minute, but move through a very small arc, about 3 degrees. In the case of cast removal, this is what keeps it from cutting skin. The secret to getting the most from an oscillating tool is in using a high quality blade and matching the blade to the job. These blades, all from Zenith Industries, are manufactured from high performance alloys and designed to cut specific materials. Each one goes through a microphase hardening process that improves performance and keeps the tool sharper longer. When it comes to cutting wood, this chrome vanadium fast cut blade is top of the line. It features a Japanese style tooth design with a double row of alternating bevel teeth. It's the best choice for clean fast cuts in wood. The spacing of the teeth allows for sawdust and small particles to be expelled, greatly reducing any tendency to burn. It's a good choice for plunge cuts in materials like laminate flooring and for cutting door jams and casings during tile, wood, or laminate flooring installations. The blue oxide coating keeps this blade from leaving marks or stains on the material being cut and protects the blade itself from rusting. This fine tooth version of the chrome vanadium blade, also with the blue oxide coating, is well suited for plunge cuts in drywall, especially when doing cut-ins for electrical boxes. This extra long blade has cobalt steel teeth and a titanium nitride coating that makes it suitable for cutting bolts, trimming off bent nails that are in awkward, difficult to reach places, and cutting pipe when there's not enough space to use conventional plumbing tools. Its long reach also makes it a good choice for cutting through framing nails during demolition. Bi-metal blades also have cobalt teeth and are a good choice for cutting through wood that has embedded nails. This blade too can be used to separate nail together framing members. Semi-circular blades made from high-speed steel offer excellent straight line cutting and can even be used with a straight edge since the teeth have zero offset and don't protrude from the sides of the blade. This is also a good choice for terminating cuts without overcutting into adjacent surfaces. For even more precise cutting, the flat, toothless portion of the blade can be used. Carbide grit blades have no teeth but instead have tough carbide grit vacuum brazed to their cutting edges. These blades come in a variety of shapes and can be used for dressing cut ceramic tile, chasing cracks when repairing concrete, and shaping cut edges on wood. This diamond grit version excels when it comes to removing tile grout or plunge cutting in concrete board.
these blades have no teeth or grit at all. Made of high-grade stainless steel, they feature sharp, knife-like edges and are used for lifting, cutting, and scraping. They're well-suited for removing caulks and sealants from around sinks, backsplashes, and tubs, lifting carpet and tile adhesive, scraping loose peeling paint, slicing through caulking before prying off wood trim, removing old silicone sealants, detaching non-slip stair treads, and even cutting carpet. This is often called a multi-function tool. Fitted with the right blade for the task at hand, I think you can see why. Every month I get a piece of mail that I really don't look forward to receiving. My utility bill. Ouch! <laughs> Well, one thing that's predictable about my utility costs, and that is that they keep going up every month. And I can't help but think that part of those heating and cooling dollars are going right out my windows. 35 years ago, when this house was built, these windows were standard fare. In those days, energy was cheap. The fact that a single pane of glass was a poor insulator was, well, not that big a deal. Then, heating and cooling costs started climbing. The storm windows that were put on about 20 years ago were supposed to make the house more energy efficient. Quite honestly, I'm not sure how effective they really are. But more importantly, I just don't like the way they look. I also don't like what it takes to clean them. So for all of those reasons, I'm going to replace my old windows, and I'm going to replace them with this, a state-of-the-art double-hung window from Pella. Now it's got the look that I want, it's very energy efficient, and you won't believe how easy this is to clean. The installation? Uh, surprisingly simple. Step one is to remove the storm windows from the inside. Then start on the frame outside. Now this storm window frame is held in place with several screws around the outside. I want to take it off and normally what I do is just use a screwdriver and back those screws out. But if you take a look here, you'll see that I've got a problem. These screw heads are covered with several coats of paint. There's no way I'm going to get a screwdriver to engage that. So I'm going to use this little tool right here. It's called a grab it. On one end is a reamer right here. That'll bore kind of a small hole in the head of the screw. And on this end is the retractor. Let me load this up in the drill and show you how it works. First, I use the reamer to create a cone-shaped depression. Then turn the bit end for end and use the retractor to back out the screw. Back inside, I use a utility knife to cut through the paint and caulk between this narrow strip of molding called a sash stop and the window casing. Then I insert a putty knife and work the sash stops loose enough to allow room for a pry bar. I'm going carefully here because I want to reuse these when I install the new window. With the stops gone, I remove the upper sash, lower sash, and window track all at the same time. This piece of wood, called a parting strip, comes out easily by gripping it with a pair of pliers. Now, with the exception of the storm window, I've been able to do all of my work from the inside. There's been very little demolition required, just the removal of these three strips of molding. The outside trim and the casing right here, still intact. With the window opening clean, it's time for a test fit. First, I check the sill to make sure it's level. Then, apply silicone sealant to the bottom corners. From my van, I get a couple of rolls of aluminum weatherproofing tape. I 
to peel off the protective backing. Then, starting on the sides, press the tape onto the surface and smooth it out with my hands. The tape has a butyl adhesive backing that will prevent any water from penetrating the sill. Next, I apply silicone sealant to the outside stop against which the new window frame will sit. The edge of the window ledge, or stoop as it's called, and the corners at the ends of the sill. Now I can set the window in place, putting the bottom in first, then tipping the frame upright and pushing it against the stops. I check to make sure the frame is square, then begin installing shims. First at the top, then the bottom, and finally the middle. For the window to operate smoothly, it's important that the gap between the sash and frame be uniform top to bottom. With the frame square and locked in position, I run screws into pre-drilled holes in the sides, through the shims, and into the jam. Then, using a utility knife, I score the shims and break off the excess. There's a small gap or space between the edge of the frame and the window opening that I fill with low expansion foam made just for this purpose. About the last thing I have left to do here on the inside is replace the sash stops I took off earlier. Outside, I begin making a watertight seal between the replacement window frame and the original opening by pressing foam backer rod into the gap between the two. Then I fill the remaining space with silicone caulk. Spray the surface with a lubricant and release liquid called caulkmate and tool the joint smooth with my finger. This is a standard window screen, but I'm going to be putting in high transparency window screens. Pella calls them Vivid View. 50% more light, three times as much airflow, and great curb appeal. As a matter of fact, it's like having no screen at all. Even though these windows are state of the art, they still look very conventional. The millwork detailing, classical hardware, and authentic proportions make them seem as if they've always been part of the house. In fact, they look even better than the original windows because I no longer have to use the storm windows. And the reason I don't have to use the storm windows is because of the way the new windows are constructed. Actually, they're made up of two pieces of glass with the space in between filled with argon gas. Now here's how that works. Older windows typically have a single pane of glass that offers little insulation value. In the winter, warm air passes right through to the outside, wasting energy. In the summer, outside heat penetrates the windows, driving up air conditioning costs. On the other hand, double insulated glass with a gas-filled barrier reflects warm air back into the house in the winter and keeps heat outside during the summer, lowering heating as well as air conditioning costs. Now these windows also have a coating on the glass. It's called a low E coating. That filters out damaging ultraviolet rays and helps prevent fading on upholstery, drapes, and carpeting. But you know what I think I like best about these windows is the way they've been designed for easy cleaning. You lift up, push the tabs on the inside, tilt this down, 
clean the outside of the window. The upper sash works the same way. When you're finished, put it back, and that's it. Good looking, energy efficient, and easy to clean. I mean, what more could you ask for in a window? In this week's sweepstakes, we're giving away a Ryobi four-piece lithium-ion compact combo power tool kit. It includes a circular saw, a work light, cordless drill and charger, and reciprocating saw, all in a rugged carrying case. Now these tools are powerful, yet compact, lightweight, and easy to handle. The lithium-ion batteries hold a charge 40% longer. To enter the sweepstakes, just go to ronhazelton.com and click on the sweepstakes banner. If your home was built in the 1960s or later, there's a good chance your walls may have a wall texture. Now, restoring or repairing that texture may seem challenging, but actually, it's easier than you may think. Wall texture is intended to hide wallboard joints and other imperfections. Usually, it's applied with some sort of spray equipment during construction. Frequently, the need to repair or restore wall texture occurs when a section of the wallboard itself has been replaced because of damage or repairs. There are actually several different styles of wall texture, but two of the most popular are knockdown and orange peel. Knockdown involves flattening the peaks left by a spray on finish, and orange peel resembles the skin texture of this popular citrus fruit. Homex makes an aerosol product for creating both styles. Even though applying wall texture is a fairly straightforward process, there are a number of variables that can come into play. Air pressure, material volume, distance from the nozzle to the wall, and spray pattern can all affect the final appearance. For this reason, the Homex aerosol applicator head has two important adjustments. This one for air pressure and this one to control the volume of material. The best way to match an existing wall texture is to experiment on a piece of scrap cardboard. Then hold the sample up next to the wall. Orange peel texture is simply sprayed on the wall and left to dry. Knockdown requires a second step using either a joint knife or this knockdown tool that features a sponge rubber pad attached to the blade. I found this tool easier to use and less likely to leave edge marks. Hold the knockdown tool almost parallel to the surface. Before spraying, hold the aerosol can upside down and shake vigorously to thoroughly mix the contents. I found that holding the can 12 to 16 inches from the wall gave me the best results. The material can be applied in a circular or linear pattern, but what's important is to keep the can in motion at all times. When you're finished, hold the can upside down and pull the trigger to clear the nozzle. After a short wait, usually a minute or less, the knockdown tool is passed over the surface using light pressure. If for any reason you're not pleased with the look, it's very simple to remove the texture and start over. Once the texture dries, it can be painted. So if you're looking for a way to replace damaged or missing wall texture, well, the solution could be right here.